Good morning. So far we've discussed the force between two charged objects. I have two charged objects. Uh, let's say they are repelled by one another. But what if I removed one of the objects? Or I could imagine that my system is just one of the objects and I don't see the other one. This object does not stop being electrified. There's nothing here that uh, depends on the other object in order for this, ob this first object that we have now to have its electrical properties. So there's some kind of intrinsic electrical quali quality that this object has that we want to describe to uh, stop our reliance on pairwise interactions between two charged objects. So let's imagine that this object here that I've been talking about is at the center of our coordinate system. So now we have Q and it's fixed at the origin, it's fancy O. And I put some test charge. I introduce some positive charge, some small positive charge, so small that it doesn't interfere with the um, electrical properties of big Q, but big enough that I can measure the force that this charge places on my test charge. So I have some force here, F. And we know how to find F, right? F is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, little q, big Q, over R squared. And since um, big Q is fixed at the origin, this equation is exact. Uh, in this case, since F is away from big Q, everything's uh, good with the R hat vector. This is an exact equation. So uh, let me factor out the little q because this quantity here, this test charge quantity, is depending on, well, depends on q, right? It depends on something that's external to the system. Uh, or external. But all of this here, this is intrinsic to Q. So this piece of the equation describes some intrinsic electrical property of the charge Q without reference to the test charge or any other charges that might be in the system. This is what's called the electric field. So we say that Big Q here has an electric field that it produces just by virtue of it being charged. And how we define the electric field, or another way to define the electric field, is to say that the force experienced by the test charge, Q, is that charge times the electric field, just like we have here. So this is another way to define it. Or I can say, that the electric field around a point charge is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught it's charge over the distance between wherever you're measuring the electric field and the charge in that direction so that positive Q have fields that go radially outward and negative Q have fields that go radially inward. So this would be for a point charge placed at the origin. But what if E isn't or Q isn't at the origin? So uh, before we get to that, now would be a good time to solve problem number one. So What if the charge is not at the origin? Well, that's interesting, right? Because imagine like these are the x and y axes. And I want 
to know the electric field at this point uh, described by the radius vector r. So you know vectors describe points in space, so we're going to describe it by the radius vector from the origin. But my charge q is over here, not at the origin. Let's say this is r prime. So r without the prime is the position that we're interested in, and r with the prime is the position of the charge. Remember, this equation has in its denominator the one we just wrote for the point charge at the origin, r squared. This is the <clears throat> this is the distance between the charge and whatever point we're interested in, since it's at the origin. And this r hat vector is good because all of the vectors that we draw from the charge to anywhere, <clears throat> anywhere in the plane are going to be along that vector. But now, what we're actually interested in is this vector, right? This is the, this is the distance between the charge and wherever you're interested, where you, wherever you want to evaluate the electric field. So that's this distance now. Well, what vector is that? This is, I always have to remember, it points to the first vector, so it has to point to here, r minus r prime. So, for the, this is q at the origin. Now, the electric field as a function of position is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Um, let me just group q there, so all the scalars are together. I moved it over. And then I get the distance between its squared. So the magnitude of this vector squared, I can write that magnitude r minus r prime squared. And r hat will be the radius vector in the direction of r minus r prime, whatever, radi uh, whatever unit vector goes in this direction. That's what this means. So this is r minus r prime, and then the hat just means this is the unit vector in that direction. <clears throat> this is bad to deal with. This is hard to deal with um, in an equation. So let's get rid of it. Remember, r hat is just whatever vector divided by its magnitude. So r minus r prime hat will be that vector, r minus r prime, divided by its magnitude, which is easy to compute. And so we're going to do the same trick that we did for computing the force for both gravity and uh, the electrostatic force in the previous lectures. I get r minus r prime in the numerator. I'll keep that in parentheses. And I get an extra factor of r minus r prime in the denominator. So I have two now. I get an extra one. That's three total. So this is good, because as long as I can write where the charge is, and as long as I know where I want to evaluate the field, I can write these vectors, I can find their magnitude, and solve for the electric field. So this is good. This is the electric field of a point charge located at R'. prime. So let me just make that completely clear. Q is now located at r prime and we want the electric field at r. That's the difference between them. So let me give you an example using this equation. Let's say uh, example there is a charge uh, Q equals minus 4 coulombs located at R prime is 2x half. 
and I want to know what is the electric field at r equals 6 x hat plus 3 y hat. First, let's compute r minus r prime. Remember, we're working with this equation. I need r minus r prime, and I need the magnitude of r minus r prime. Sorry, q is here. So r minus r prime, r is here, r prime is here. This only has an x hat component. We get 6 minus 2 x hat is 4 x hat, and I get 3 y hat from the r. Cool. And its magnitude, then, is the square root of x squared, 4 squared, plus the square, uh, y squared. That's 16 plus 9 is 25, square root of 25 is 5. So, the electric field, and I can write this at the location 6x hat plus 3y hat, is minus 4 over 4 pi epsilon naught times r minus r prime, 4x hat plus 3y hat, put that in parentheses, divided by the magnitude 5 cubed. And we're done. Uh, if I want, I can cancel this. Uh, 5 cubed is 125. So I get minus 1 over 125 pi epsilon naught times this vector 4x hat plus 3y hat. And so I have a perfectly defined vector with magnitudes and everything and a direction that gives me the exact electric field. And if I want to know whatever force that this uh, charge of negative 4 coulombs puts on some second charge, I just have to multiply by whatever the charge of that second object is in order to get it. Remember, to get the force, you multiply it by the charge of the second object times the electric field at wherever it's located. Okay. Well, what if, uh, what if there are multiple Q? So that's the electric field of one charge, uh, wherever it might be. What if there are more of them? Well, I just use uh, the electric field equation um, for each uh, location of the Q. So we have um, enumerated the Q now with I, like Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and so on. So I could find the electric field of the first charge is a function of the position is Q1, so this is electric field 1, so I get Q1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And then I just get R minus, remember it's the R prime that depends on Q, so I get R1 prime over R minus R1 prime cubed. And uh, for the second for the second charge, I get another electric field, Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught, R minus R2 prime over R minus R2 prime cubed, and so on for however many charges I have. And then the second step is to just add them, just like we do for forces. So now the total electric field at whatever position you're at is the sum of all of the individual electric fields. So this would be the first field plus the second field and so on for however many fields you have, for however many charges. Notice that this is the same as the superposition of forces, and it is actually identically equal. If I multiply everything by Q, so I have 
the electric field, the total electric field is the sum of the component electric fields for each charge. If I multiply everything by Q, this is now the total force and this would be the force due to the first charge plus the force um, due to the second charge on Q, so the total force on Q. It's actually the exact same equation. This is just the superposition, the linear superposition of uh, forces, fields, it works for uh, scalar functions that we're going to define later and so on. I want to now address the question of what is this vector field? I keep saying that it's an electric field and writing vectors, defining them for every position in space, but let's put on our mathematicians caps for just a minute and talk about in detail uh, what I actually mean by a vector field and uh, also a scalar field. So the first question I want to ask and if you were here I would demand that you answer um, is what is a function? Just from your math classes you should have a pretty good idea of uh, what's the kind of formal idea of what a function is. Uh, in the most basic sense, it takes some number, let's say it's a real number, it takes some number or group of numbers, so you could have a function of more than one number or more than one quantity, and the function then gives you some other number in the same field or the same uh, field of numbers, the real numbers. So the equation y equals f of x is what's called a mapping of some group of arguments. So the, this set of uh, x variables that you plug into the function are called the argument and returns to you some other group of numbers y that depend on x and the function. So this is an example, um, basically everything you've ever done in algebra and calculus and pre-calculus, I'm pretty sure, have all been with scalar functions. Because all of these numbers x that you use as arguments are scalars, right? They're all just numbers or quantities, some real number. Um, and all of the numbers that you get out of the function are also uh, just numbers. So this is an example of a scalar function. So indulge me for a minute. Let me expand this idea to what's called a vector function. Imagine I have, uh, I could have some scalar that's just some number, and a vector, let's say v, that is in space. So it has three components. Because it has three components, I need three no real numbers in order to specify it. And so I say that this vector is an element of r cubed. So it's, uh, we now are dealing with three-dimensional space. If it was uh, I'm not going to go there. I want to define some vector function that returns me a vector w. And I can just say, for example, that it takes as its argument some a scalar or a vector. And I could make this any group of scalars and vectors. So I could say that my function um, w is a function of alpha 1 and alpha 2, on and on until alpha n, and a function of the vectors v1, v2, on and on, until vn. So I can define it as a function of any number of scalars and vectors, and it's returning to me a vector. Uh, how do you do this? Well, for example, the electric field is a function that takes scalars, the charge, um, epsilon, and vectors, r and r prime, and gives you back a vector. So that's an example of a scalar function. 
but I can write just a really simple scalar function here. Let's just say that this is the function that scales v. So w is going to be in the same direction as v, but it's going to be a different size determined by alpha. So this is an example of a vector function. So, so far we've um, discussed functions, both scalar and vector, and kind of just the idea of what they are. But what makes it a field? Well, if I take, let's say my argument is um, all real numbers, or, um, or some subset. So all real numbers such that its value is greater than zero. So all positive real numbers. Uh, I could plug in to my scalar function every point in the plane, every point in space. And I get back for every point in space a value for my function. So I could say, um, let's just say uh, y equals f of um, x Let's say, yeah, okay. The function y equals f of x is just x. So they're equal to one another. So here, um, y is 1. Here, y is 1. Here, y is 1. Uh, here, y is 2, and so on. I can define at every point in space uh, what the value of y is. And you can imagine that this is three-dimensional, so that these ones extend in an infinite column in and out of the board as well as down. So every point in space just gets assigned to it its uh, value of the x-coordinate. This is an example of a scalar field. So what makes you the field is that you're now defining the value for a bunch of uh, numbers, a whole group, a whole subset of uh, numbers that you can define uh, whatever the problem wants. I'm not explaining this very well, but hopefully you get the idea. A vector field, then, is the same sort of thing. Let's say I have the plane, and at every point in space, I assign to it a vector. So wherever I choose, I can do an equation and get a vector out so that at every point I can draw a vector. And you can imagine that this also extends infinitely in and out of the board so that for every point in space, I can define a vector. So what are some examples of scalar fields? Well. Um, temperature, right? I, there's a temperature at every point in the room, and the temperature is just a number. And so I can give a scalar to every location in the universe, and uh, which describes its temperature. So that's an example of a scalar field. What else? Um, pressure is a good one. So we have air pressure on us right now. At every point in space, there's a different pressure depending on local changes in temperature or how high above the Earth's surface you are. But it's a scalar because I can just give it a number. Pressure doesn't have any kind of direction with it. Uh, what's some other examples of a scalar field? Density, right? I can talk about what the density of this board is at any point, and it just returns me one number. Density doesn't have a direction. What about a vector field? So what are some examples of vectors that I can define for every point, or functions that I can define for every point that give me back vectors? Well, we talked about one, the electric field. You could also say the uh, gravity field around Earth is an example of a vector field, because it's always pointing towards the center of the Earth. What else? Um, the magnetic field. To go back to scalar fields, we'll define uh, in a couple of lectures 
the potential energy of a charge and it it's, turns out that's a scalar field as well so the magnetic field uh, you could also say like fluid velocity so every point in space if I'm talking about air which is a fluid every little uh, point has a particular direction where the bulk of the fluid is moving in and I can define that as the fluid velocity and we know velocity is a vector and so this is an example of a vector field.